Well, it's a, a great pleasure and an honor to be here. Um, I've known Jim for perhaps about uh, 40 years, and um, I've always been extremely impressed by his early biophysical work, which is what <coughs> I've been asked to talk about. And it's been, um, it seems, in fact, and I'm going to show you this, that our work from our own lab, which is focused on the extracellular space, has followed uh, faithfully in Jim's footsteps, um, but just about 10 or 20 years later. Um, he pioneered so many interesting things, and I'm going to, to try to, to show you this. Um, when I looked at what he'd done in this early phase of his career, I um, realized there were about 18 papers at least, and counting, and obviously in 15 minutes I can't cover these, so I've selected a number of, of papers, and particularly I'm going to focus on his work on brain impedance, which tells us uh, a lot about uh, extracellular space <laughs> and, and other things. And um, on stimulation, he made, made, as you'll see, very important contributions to um, our understanding of how cells are stimulated by electric currents. So um, let me begin with impedance. And um, I think the, the first paper of, of relevance here was in 1963, um, when Jim studied specific impedance of the rabbit's cerebral cortex. Um, <clears throat> this, of course, goes back a long time to when he was in Seattle. And his uh, technique was to use what's called the uh, four electrode um, setup. Uh, I guess we can use a pointer on here, but anyway, it doesn't matter too much. Uh, basically, you have two electrodes that supply a current. One comes in here uh, on, on the left, and then there's an indifferent electrode that takes the current out. You use a sinusoidal wave, and then you use two more electrodes to measure the potential difference generated in various regions of the cortex by this current passing through it. This so-called four-electrode technique avoids the problem of uh, electrode polarization. And uh, for those of you who uh, go back a long way, you will see that we're using cathode followers here, followed by triodes for the amplification. And that will mean nothing to most of the audience because um, tubes have been superseded for a while by transistors. Uh, in this technique, you um, have an oscilloscope and you display the, um, the, ampli the, the signal that you're going, going in on one axis and the signal that you measure on the other. And if it's pure, uh, pure resistance, you just get a straight line, which gives you the resistance of value when it's calibrated. But if there's a phase shift, in other words, if the, the phase of the waves are shifted in some way by, by the tissue, then you'll get, get an ellipsoid, which enables you to measure that property. And um, what Jim found, uh, to summarize a lot of work, was that uh, the impedance was between about 200 and 350 uh, ohm centimeters in the cortex, and, um, and it varies with frequency. The, the, the impedance went down with, as frequency went up to 5,000 uh, hertz and, uh, and increased at 5 hertz. And also, the, the, um, the line didn't lie flat against the axis, <coughs> but, uh, but on this scale, it moved above it to show there was a phase shift. And, um, I, I will pass on in a minute to talk about that. I just want to note that, uh, that Jim's uh, figure legend here notes that the uh, oval represents a rabbit. And um, uh, this, this was Jim's uh, early um, uh, phase of <coughs> animal representation. And it was uh, rather abstract. But as you will see, this changes along with his research. Um, Anyway, in the same year, Jim, by himself, produced a sophisticated mathematical model. And I think it's a, it's a great, it uh, always amazes me, um, given his background, that, that he was so very good at making mathematical models. He incorporated current flow through glia and through neurons, and in through what particularly interested me, the extracellular <laughs> space. And he was able to predict the sort of curves that he showed um, there by assigning a particular value. It's a full cable theory model. And um, what he concluded was that the volume fraction of the extracellular space, the amount of extracellular space in the brain, was uh, less than or equal to 15%. And this was really quite an achievement and one that was very, very interesting. And he also said in one of these papers, diffusion follows laws similar to those for current flow. And of course, that was a cue uh, many, about 20 years later, for us to introduce a technique where we could measure the diffusion through the extracellular space instead of current flow. Um, I won't dwell on this, but we essentially um, release ions from one uh, microelectrode and then can sense their arrival at another microelectrode about 100 microns away. And this gives us um, diffusion curves, <coughs> which enable us to measure effective diffusion coefficient in the brain and to measure the volume fraction, the property that Jim had 
got from his model, we could actually measure it directly and um, by comparing these curves in the brain and in the free medium, you can get these results. And the upshot of this was that we found that the extracellular space was about 20% uh, close to, to Jim's upper bound. And in fact, <coughs> from a technical point of view, Jim would probably have got the same result, but he assumed a very low, a very, very low value for the impedance of glial cell membranes. Um, but um, uh, now I think we put it up, and pro probably the two, the two models would, would agree completely these days. So he was way ahead of his time in measuring the, the size of the extracellular space. Um, he also noted in a later paper that uh, some of his co-workers had sort of short-circuited the modeling by using what was called Maxwell's equation um, to, to get a measure of the extracellular space. Maxwell's equation says simply that if you have a set of non-conducting spheres and they're very sort of dilute, then you can measure the composite resistance of the whole medium. But that's for dilute spheres, and you get a, a relationship for um, the two, the, the specific resistivity, um, and uh, the, the um, uh, versus the, the free value as a function of the volume fraction. And you can translate that into diffusion. And uh, we wanted to test this because obviously it shouldn't apply to the brain, as Jim said. But uh, the question was, what happens if the spheres are very closely packed? Or in fact, uh, we used um, truncated octahedra which, and, and other solids, which can pack together so, so that they can have any value of extracellular space, whereas spheres do not pack. And we showed, in fact, using Monte Carlo simulation, that this does actually hold for densely packed um, cells. So you could, in principle, use this uh, to, to make a measurement of the extracellular space. But uh, we also found, that when we did the diffusion measurements, that it did not give the predicted value. The ratio of the two diffusion coefficients is different. And that suggested the extracellular space was really more complex than we imagined with um, uh, imaginations and various other things. Um, and um, the extracellular space geometry is complicated. And we were also able to go back and calculate what the impedance would be with this model. And it showed that, in fact, it wasn't very, very good, uh, thereby verifying Jim's very, very a very prescient observation that current, when it's applied to the, to the brain, does flow through the extracellular space, but a significant component goes through the cells as well, as he said, and many of his colleagues had neglected this, but he, in fact, had recognized it and accounted for it and was, was years ahead of his time. Um, he went on to do several other really interesting measurements of impedance. He looked at spreading depression, which, as you know, is a wave of spreading depolarization across the brain, uh, which knocks out all activity for a minute or two. He measured a large increase in impedance uh, during spray and depression at different frequencies and a, and a very interesting change in phase angle. And later, we, uh, again, many years later, repeated measurements with ions where we simply trapped large ions in the extracellular space and measured their concentration change. And we showed a very similar rise in the concentration to Jim's impedance measurements. And um, as Jim says, his impedance measurements um, uh, demonstrated that the size of the intracellular interstitial space must contract during spreading depression. In other words, it gets smaller, and our impedance measurements uh, did indeed uh, show, show the same thing. But we also showed that when we used anions of a similar size, they actually left the extracellular space, suggesting there were big changes in membrane properties of cells during uh, permeability during spreading depression. And I won't go into all of that. It's been been extensively verified, but that probably was the basis of his remarkable changes in, in phase. So already he had data that, that, that pointed to the much more complex phenomena going on during spreading depression. Um, the final topic I'll deal with in, um, in, uh, in his impedance measurements and, and did many other studies was, of course, his uh, study of sleep. And this was some years later. He now has his four electrode array built into a little pedestal which you can <laughs> implant in the brain of a rat. And um, he's able to, to make measurements in the waking and the sleeping rat. His electronics has also improved. He's much more complex using lock in amplifiers. And his representation of animals has <laughs> moved towards realism now. So we, we really see a huge advance in many different areas here. And um, what he found was in a subicular area, there is invariably an increase in magnitude of impedance up to 25% during paradoxical sleep. And if you recall, during spray and depression, you also get an increase in impedance. So that suggests the extracellular space is decreasing during, during sleep. Um, 
And of course, again, many, many years later, we came back to this in a study with Mike and Nadegaard, which has become rather infamous, um, about uh, the, the brain of the mouse during sleep, and again used our technique to uh, measure the um, changes in extracellular space in the sleeping mouse. And we found that there was a 60% decrease in the interstitial space. And so that's, uh, that, that actually conflicts with what Jim was saying, but there are many possible reasons for this, different reasons, and so on. But I think it points to the fact that these measurements, when combined, still point to the fact there is much to be done here. We don't understand all of this. And again, Jim's data is just as relevant today as it was when he got it all these years ago. Um, so he's done some very exciting things on impedance, which I think have not been fully recognized and could probably be used today with, with uh, modern electronic techniques to, to do some really wonderful things following in his ideas. Um, I'm going to go on to stimulation. Um, of course, after Jim had measured impedance extensively, then uh, by passing small currents through the brain, which didn't disturb cells, then he realized, of course, if you pass larger currents now using the impedance data, you would, you would have the opportunity to, um, to, to uh, actually study how cells were activated by currents passing through the brain. And um, his first study with Spencer B. Ment, who was on um, myelinated, uh, central myelinated fibers and dorsal columns, and um, uh, this was, again, followed his usual uh, way, methodical method of doing very good experiments. And then also a second paper following it up with detailed cable models to understand how the cells were stimulated. Um, and this, this, this was very nice work. But what I think was perhaps the most important contribution here, one of his most significant contributions of his early phase was um, an article he wrote in 1975, a review article on which elements are excited which are bioelectrical stimulation in the mammalian central nervous system. This has received more than 1,600 citations and is the classic work um, when everybody goes to when they want to understand how cells become stimulated. It's, of course, with deep brain stimulation, this has been, been received a renaissance, essentially, um, of, of, of interest. And it's really a very important contribution to Jim. This is one of his pictures of how the cell, how a monopolar electrode, the current spreads. Some of it goes through the cells. Some of it goes through the extracellular space. Again, the sort of model he used in interpreting impedance, he's now turned around to understand how cells become stimulated. And once again, we followed in Jim's footsteps many years later um, because he noted many things about stimulation. One of them was the orientation of cell bodies and axons with respect to current is important. And I became interested in this problem for other reasons. And with Chris Chan in um, 1986, we set up a system where we pass current between two uh, silver plates and um, with, a, with a isolated turtle cerebellum between them, we could pass sinusoidal currents and see when cells were modulated. And then we would fill the cells with HRP, identify them, and try to, to establish how the geometry of the dendrites captured current. Uh, we did this for stellate and for, for Purkinje cells. And um, we were able to arrive at a value which, which has been arrived otherwise, that many neurons are modulated by, by fields of the order of 10 to 20 millivolts per millimeter. Again, um, following up on, on Jim's work, really, and, and uh, elucidating with slightly more modern techniques some of the things that you can do. So tremendously important contribution in two areas, impedance and in, in, um, in stimulation. Um, but he was also interested in other things during this period. He looked at extracellular potassium during epilepsy. He looked at chloric chlor content in glia. Um, and a, a remarkable paper, a, a single author paper in Science in 1964, Synaptic Learning Due to Electroosmosis, a Theory. Um, it's, it's an amazing little paper. Um, I wonder where on earth that came from. It just came out of Jim's really creative mind, I think. And, um, Although I, I have to say it is not actually the answer to learning, it is, uh, it is nevertheless a very interesting paper, and it would be remiss not to, uh, to uh, draw people's attention to, to his, his very fertile mind, which has always been with us. And um, with that, I'll conclude and say what a pleasure it has been to know Jim all these years and um, what, what an honor it is to be here. Thank you.